This is Duke University. Okay, hey, thanks for the great discussion so far. We're not done yet because we haven't talked about implementation, which of course is critical, and benchmarking our progress so we can track how well we've done. I'm gonna ask if, if you no longer have a note taker at your table, would somebody please step up at each table to take notes because it's really critical for us to have our discussions and thoughts recorded moving forward with um, collecting the learnings from today, we're going to rely on those notes quite heavily. So please make sure somebody at each table is recording the discussion. Um, and now for our final panel. Can I interrupt yes, just for one course. moment? Okay, just a couple of housekeeping things. One is that uh, we're getting toward the end of the day. People's flights are coming. There's going to be a temptation to leave. Um, you're forbidden from leaving, so we're going to lock the doors here in a moment. Now, I, I know some of you will have to leave, and a couple of things I didn't want to lose the strand with. One is that we want to find out which of you are interested in continuing this conversation, and we'd like to um, be able to continue to sort of have at least an online dialogue about where there might be opportunities for ongoing research and discussion around some of the themes that came up today. So we'll do a card drop over at the reception. So if you're coming to the reception, that's great. If you aren't, please leave your card with me if you're interested in being included in that discussion as we go forward. Forward. Second thing is we have an evaluation form, um, which uh, I'd like you to fill out. So if you are leaving early, it would be great if you could fill that out before you go. I'm happy to give it to you. Um, if not, I'll give it out after the end of this session for you to complete before we go over to the reception. And third thing is um, this morning, I you know, felt time pressure to get through things fast. Uh, I, I dropped the ball on one thing, which is that one of our key on-campus partners has been the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions and weren't, uh, weren't uh, up on the banner, and I didn't mention it this morning. So Eitan Gummerman, who was here for most of the session, has had to leave. But I wanted to acknowledge that this has really been a cross-campus initiative. Um, EDGE sort of took the lead and, you know, brought, uh, started this process with EDF. Um, Fuqua has been very involved, Nicholas School with Bill Shemides being here, and Nicholas Institute being part of building this too. So and I say that not just to, you know, make sure I'm acknowledging all the right people, but to give a sense of the approach that we try to take to these issues, which is as interdisciplinary and comprehensive as we can. The, the relationship between what's happening with the climate and really understanding the environmental dimensions of these issues, understanding the role of corporations and the business strategies that can drive real change on this, and understanding um, the, the policy domain both as a barrier or as an enabler for real change in this space. So really taking those different kind of lenses and looking at these issues in real 360 kind of um, per, um, perspective. So um, cards if you'd like to stay involved, evaluation form if you're leaving um, before or at the end of this session, and uh, we're all in this together. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gail. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my name's Gail Boyd. Uh, I'm on the faculty here at Duke. I'm over in the economics department. And before I came to Duke, uh, actually for most of my career, I've been studying industrial energy use and energy efficiency for about 25 years now. Uh, in the last five or six years, I've been working very closely with Energy Star, uh, developing some uh, benchmarking tools uh, for manufacturing facilities, uh, which is how I kind of probably got drafted into this session. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of steal something uh, from Energy Star and, and, and help it sort of, use that to sort of frame uh, uh, some of the discussion. Uh, I'm not trying to steer it in this direction, but I think it's useful. I think it captures a lot of things we've been doing all day. Uh, and actually this, this, this diagram, which I uh, drew, in my, I, I have a special uh, printer that looks exactly like my handwriting. Um, and this, is, this diagram, this energy, this is uh, Energy Star's uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, corporate energy management plan. Uh, really, they didn't invent anything. They just talked to all of their partners and found that this is what the successful energy programs do. And, and since my, this is my handwriting, I'll have to read it to you because you probably can't. The first part's make a commitment. And we've talked about, you know, getting, you know, you have to get that started. Um, 
And then you, you drop into sort of this virtuous cycle, which is the first thing is to assess performance and set goals. And that's right where we're at now in, in terms of this discussion, which is to talk about benchmarking, which I'm going to actually sort of expand to just basically mean uh, measurement and evaluation. Because actually I've found over the years that if you put an economist like myself in a room with two engineers, you'll get at least five definitions of what a benchmark is. Um, so I'm just going to throw that word out and just talk generally about uh, measurement and performance assessment. So assess performance, set goals, and then you drop into this circle. You need an action plan, you need to implement it, which is what we're going to be talking about. You need to evaluate again. In other words, that's, that's that benchmarking thing again. Uh, in the Energy Star world, you need to recognize uh, achievements, and, and, and that's what drives this circle. You also need to reassess and maybe do some new goal setting. And in that context, I think, when we talk about implementation, how it fits it in, how it fits it in with uh, the evaluation and measurement part, uh, it's uh, in some sense where the rubber hits the road, uh, but it's also part of a management concept that we need to break through the, sort of the typical economist paradigm, the joke about the $20 bill. You know, it couldn't be there, someone would have picked it up. My experience in interacting with, with industry people over the last many years is that maybe there aren't that many $20 bills on the sidewalk, but if we had a good management system, there's so much change just, just lying there. We need effective ways to go around and, and scoop it up. And so that's where the management side sort of meets the technology side. And with that as kind of a framework, I'll just let everyone introduce themselves, say a little bit about what they've been doing. And I actually what I want to do is pretty much try to shut up and then draw questions from the floor, because I think we've all had plenty of time to get to know each other, and, and let's just have a more open dialogue. So. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is John Queenan. I'm with uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland group. Uh, we also own uh, Citizens Bank uh, here in the United States. Anyway, just give you a little profile uh, about the bank, quick commercial, and then I'll <laughs> go into the, my background might be helpful. Um, uh, the bank has about uh, 26,000 employees in the U.S. Uh, we have a uh, retail banking arm, which is Citizens Bank, which also deals with commercial side of business. And then we also have um, our investment banking side, which does with uh, corporate lending as well as uh, trading. Headquarters is in Stanford, Connecticut for the Americas. Uh, we also have operations as Royal Bank of Scotland. You might imagine it's uh, based in Edinburgh as well as we have dual headquarters in London. Um, and I'm just really excited to be here, first off. Uh, I think the energy level, uh, and actually was at an EDF uh, event yesterday, which is great as well, up in Boston. But just to kind of give you a little perspective about my background, um, 1996, I graduated from a similar program that Duke had uh, is here. Is it was a multidisciplinary program, and um, at that time, I started a chapter of an, an organization. It was called Business for Social Responsibility. For you that you know, that turned into Net Impact. So it's great to see the level of maturity in this. And at that time, there was a lot of folks uh, around the table saying you could never make a career. Um, out of sustainability, John, you're going, you should go to law school, you should do this, you should do that, and uh, here we are today. So I want to give you guys a little bit of ins inspiration. Even in a down economy, I think you're doing some great work uh, as well. And there was many different stepping stones to get to this seat, actually. And, and first part of my career, I spent about 12 years in the big four consulting. Um, you know, I got all the acronyms, you know, PwC, KPMG, uh, D&T, you know, the alphabet soup there. But that was a great learning experience to see how business operates and so forth. And in there, I focused uh, first in an environmental consulting group that was focused on litigation compliance. Too much paperwork, too many, too many issues. I wanted to get more to the strategy side of things where I thought there was more opportunities, more value add. Uh, from there, uh, progressed. Um, uh, focused into financial services, uh, consultant to uh, banks, and that's how I got into the banking area. My two actually big clients were Microsoft and, and, and Citigroup, um, and went into a role there, jumped ship uh, to work for UBS for two years as their director of ecology, uh, in a similar role that I am now here in, at RBS. And my role basically focuses around reducing, uh, protecting and enhancing our environmental reputation, in a nutshell. And there's four legs to that. There's the risk management side, uh, there's the operational impact, there's our community and colleague engagement, 
and uh, products and services. So those are our four legs of our strategy. I was initially brought in to focus on operational impact. So that's my connection to energy. Unlike probably a lot of the folks that you've probably heard today, I'm a little bit more big picture, environmental affairs, if you will, as opposed to deep energy. But since we don't have uh, such as much focus as I'd like to see on energy, I stepped in to fill the gap and, and sponsored uh, one of the interns, which we had a uh, good project. So hopefully that gives you a little perspective. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dan Gisser at Eaton Corporation. And uh, actually, before I go a little further and introduce myself and, 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 uh, and sort of what I do, I wanted to extend a big thank you and congratulations to Duke University and, uh, and to the EDGE program for your launch. It's, I think you're feeling a need. And uh, so we're really glad that you're doing it, and we're really glad to be here. So congratulations, and also a big congratulations to Environmental Defense Fund uh, for pulling this off. <laughs> it's been a lot of, and to all of us and all of you. So good job. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and we hosted a Climate Core fellow, Judd Eater, this summer. Uh, and I work at Eaton Corporation, which is really interesting. We're a 12 or $13 billion power management company. And we sort of start with, we're selling this sort of stuff, and I work mostly in marketing and sales, so I think about it that way. Uh, we're selling solutions to help companies uh, adopt energy efficiency, whether it's electrical and in buildings or distribution or, or generation, or transportation and fuel economy. Uh, but, but we're also trying to live it. And, and so I work mostly on the sales side, but Judd was working mostly on the, the how do we do it ourselves side. And I think we're, we're gonna try to bring a little bit of that perspective to this as well. Uh, in, in terms of, of uh, metrics, we're right in the midst, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of, we're gonna, we made a commitment to reduce our own greenhouse gases by 18% uh, by 2012. We're gonna be able to do it and we'll, we'll do it ahead of time. But we're coming to the time where it's set the next goal. So in terms of metrics, what should it be? <laughs> and we're starting to ask that question. <laughs> and uh, what do we base it on? Uh, and we don't know the answer yet, uh, and so I'm asking you for help. Uh, and, um, and, and do we base it on what we think we can do? Do we base it on benchmarking what our peer companies have done? Do we base it on what our customers or investors are asking us to do? Uh, and, and sort of, who cares? So, so that's sort of a big piece of it from my point of view. Uh, another piece that we're thinking about is the idea of having metrics uh, and measures implies that there's process. And if we have process, we, we talked this morning in some of our keynotes about uh, having a few visionary leaders in a company who set the tone. It's great if it comes to the top, at Eaton it does. Uh, but it doesn't have to, it can come from other places. But what happens when those people move on in their careers and move on to other jobs? Or how do you, you want to have the, the corporate process to fill that. And so how do we build some of that leadership and the metrics right into the, the regular running of the company and the regular process, and, and, and where does that happen? Uh, and, and then the other thing that really hit me this morning and, and continuing on to the day about, about metrics is uh, efficiency implies, maybe at a first level, percentage improvement. And sometimes that's not the right goal, and we've been, one of the things that we do is we sell hybrid drive trains for refuse trucks. And I was in a meeting with a, a large customer on Wednesday, and we spent much of the meeting trying to go away from that percentage improvement in fuel economy in a refuse truck to 1,000 gallons of fuel per year, an absolute number. And, uh, and you can turn that into greenhouse gases too. Uh, and, the, and there's lots of reasons why I want to go there, but getting to that absolute is really an important part of this. Uh, and so that's the other thing that really struck with me. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Judd Eater. Um, I am a second year MBA student at University of Minnesota. In the summer, I was uh, at Eaton. Um, I, uh, I think a little bit of a unique situation. I was in the uh, supply chain group, and my boss was the uh, um, director of global purchasing for the indirect materials, which included energy. So he was more or less the energy champion for Eaton's energy reduction strategy which had been in place since uh, roughly 2006, more or less, because that's when that 18% reduction commitment was made. Um, so I was working within an existing, uh, existing energy reduction framework that already had a lot of great people doing a lot of great projects, already had established suppliers for things like lighting and HVAC and compressed air. Um, and so I, I guess 
I, I focused a little bit on the projects, but there were two, um, two really big other areas in addition to identifying, uh, identifying specific projects that I focused on. The first of which was process-related uh, areas, so helping individual facilities, which Eaton has 200 of them, 200 diversified industrial facilities, so they have unique equipment, they have unique processes, helping them, uh, helping provide tools for them to identify energy savings in their own facilities since some of the process related things are vastly different. Um, and the second thing that I, that I really worked on in addition uh, was this benchmarking idea. So there was a large corporate strategy on energy reduction and greenhouse gas reduction. So that came, came from above. Mm -hmm. So that comes from the corporate level and that's trickling down through divisions, through business units, through regions. And then all of the actual capital project implementation and budgets are run through the facilities. So there's this tactical approach on, on sort of the ground level, if you will, where facilities managers, process engineers, uh, sustainability managers, uh, all sorts of different, uh, different functional groups are coming up with projects and implementing them. And so the benchmarking was, you know, what are we doing? How are we reaching our goal for the purpose of selling it internally and for telling the story externally? So how are we doing? And we talked about some of those measurements like greenhouse, you know, investment dollars per greenhouse gas reduced. Yeah. Uh, things like that, you know, that were mentioned in the earlier panel. And so I, I kind of served this middle role where this, where this strategic implementation mm -hmm. was coming down and these tactical measurements were coming up. And, and so that's kind of where I, where I fit into this benchmarking conversation. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here as well. Well, I can certainly start asking these guys questions, but you know, I'd be more than happy to just open it directly to the floor and get some get some conversation going here. So, uh, if you have any questions about, you know, look at this whole business of implementation, evaluation, you know, measurement and benchmark, um, fire away. Otherwise, I'll start coming up with stuff. Okay. A question. Okay. I'm just curious about um, when you have capital budgeting processes that may get in the way of like certain implementation plans, because um, I know that those are always like a little bit, you know, if you have a scheduled uh, capital budgeting process that in place, um, what does that do sometimes in your implementation timeline if it needs to be, you know, longer out than, you know, what you can actually, if, what you can do to get the savings for, for certain projects? I mean, kind of just curious like how you approach that. Um, well, for me, we're actually going through uh, uh, actually the, some of the business case that Stuart, Stuart DeCuse over there, who's uh, our Climate Corps fellow, and having some of these conversations right now. And we'll get into, I guess, some of the barriers of implementation. Um, I think, especially for a bank or uh, professional service where uh, um, the finance is used to some more operating expenses, the capital um, gets a little bit trickier. And, and plus, a lot of organi and this goes back to an organizational challenge. As organizations were growing quite rapidly, um, not too long ago, you know, uh, there's <laughs> we kind of stabilized a bit, uh, put it mildly. But as they were growing rapidly, it was just grow, 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 and you had all these different systems, including accounting systems and finance systems and modeling. So um, and there's different you know variables and, and and calculations going in, and so one business unit might quantify it one way, another, another way, um, you know, at the end of the day, if the finance team, I think this is one of the challenges, if the finance team doesn't have an appreciation for some of these corporate goals, because we also have those corporate goals as well. Um, so we've got the top down, um, even uh, we've got the approval to go ahead, but the finance is a, is a control function just to make sure we're not spending money recklessly. Um, there's a gap, there's a, there's a knowledge gap there, on both ways actually. And so, um, I think companies have to systematically kind of uh, join that up a little bit. And actually even one of Stuart's recommendations, which I agree with too, is maybe having point people in different, or, you know, the finance organization that can um, develop solutions as, say, as, as opposed to saying no, right? So that we're creative. They're there to help the company. We know it's the right thing to do. We know it makes sense. And it's just kind of coming up and, and making sure you joined up a little bit. Um, I don't know if you guys want to... Uh, I guess I have a couple comments um, that, you know, this is specifically relating back to, to what I saw at, at Eaton. Um, and I'm sure as everybody saw here that was working on projects, it doesn't take much, it doesn't take long for a project to get started and then have a life of its own, have its own personality. And every single project coming from a, a 
a kind of a construction project management experience. Every single project has a life of its own. There's somebody with invested political capital. Uh, there's somebody that came up with the project. Um, there's somebody who recently put in a project that you might be putting a project in over. Um, there, there's always an adventure that's, <laughs> that's involved in that. And part of, the, part of the challenge, I think, and this is coming from Eaton, who's, who's kind of incorporated a lot of those energy projects that they're working on into uh, their general project management principles, is now all of a sudden, uh, you're competing for limited resources in any of these cases, right? There's a capital budget, you're competing for limited resources, not every project is going to get approved. Um, and, and so one of the really big advantages of having that first step, which is that commitment step, is to have that extra tag that you can always throw on a project. So I, a lot of the projects that I, even though they might not have had um, as good of a payback, if you could say, oh, well, boy, the CEO made an 18% carbon reduction goal. I'm going to write that right here in the description of this project. Yeah. Um, you know, and you can kind of equate all of these uh, metric tons of CO2 for your projects to this goal. That, that especially helped. Um, and then uh, I think the second, second problem, so that's more of an advantage. The second comment I have, which is kind of a struggle, is, uh, I mean, we all we talk about the siloing issue a lot, but that's, that's always difficult because when you talk about a commitment and something that's on somebody's personal goals, um, I think John with, uh, with AT&T made a good comment about, you know, everybody has some sort of percentage reduction goal that's, a, that's associated with their, uh, their bonus structure or, or their incentive packages, something like that. Um, but, you know, you get into a situation where in certain cases in Eaton there were, in, you know, EHS uh, sustainability managers that had reduction percentages on their goals, but they didn't have access to the capital budget. The capital budget came from the operations excellence group which manages all the capital projects. Yet the project recommendations were coming from the supply chain group, which is working with all the suppliers and bringing up the project. So that it's, it, it, gets, it gets messy in a hurry, but it's, it's kind of making sure that you're fundamentally tagging those projects with the ultimate goal of, of carbon reduction. That's what helped me on those, so. Let me say one other quick thing, though. At some point, there are natural tensions in organizations, so that's fine. You have to, if you have the vision, the policy, and the, and, and, and the backing, you got to go over the top of finance sometimes to make sure that they sometimes, and work with them, but sometimes you have to escalate it up and not be afraid to do that, especially if it's a, it's a no-brainer type project as I'm talking about. So sometimes it doesn't always fit the models that were there. Sometimes you have to change the models. You know, and I think we might be in a little bit of a new world that you know, much of the value of organizations are actually coming out of non-financial indicators as well as financial, but the model's all about financial, so you got to kind of we're starting to reconcile some of those challenges. One of the things we're trying to do, just real fast, is, is, is learn to, to sell that piece of it, to learn to sell that language. And we're so used to, t to selling in terms of uh, payback period. And can we also learn to talk and, and sell in terms of providing the, the sustainability and, and greenhouse gas wave or whatever it is, and, and frame the savings that way as well, and, and find the right people in our customers' organizations who think that way. Yeah, I'm curious about whether, um, I know that there's been some recent efforts around that companies could look externally to, to say, all right, a lighting retrofit should be this, just to get more comfort around the risks of, of uh, a different project. And I'm curious if you've done that in your own organization, and if you are, I know there's an article in the Times recently about some groups trying to lead that effort. Um, are you familiar with, with some other things that might be happening externally in that regard? You probably saw what we were doing. Go ahead. Um, I guess I could, could comment from sort of a general perspective, the whole idea of the generation of projects and then kind of at the front and then the back end of evaluating the projects and then sharing that knowledge is all information transfer. And especially when you start looking at large uh, global companies that in and of itself, doesn't matter what topic you're talking about, is a, is a big struggle. Um, the, the collection process, at least, that I, that I saw at, uh, uh, at Eaton involved um, a, lot of, a lot of legwork, to be honest. So when, when we're talking about um, who has the knowledge for projects, Eaton has an electrical services and solutions group that does a lot of external consulting. And so they have all the knowledge housed there for identification of projects. Um, so it sort of served as an internal database. Uh, but there wasn't that external database, so it's a, it's a 
definite need out there. Um, so that, group's had, that group had the, uh, the project identification knowledge, and then it's, it's how do you transfer that. So that's that trickle down, the high level strategy. Here's the information. Let's try to get it down to all of the 200 facilities. But how do we do that? It becomes an, you know, an IT issue. It becomes a database problem. Um, so I, I guess in terms, of, uh, in terms of all of that information sharing with projects, I guess I saw, um, uh, saw a lot of good things, and I also saw a lot of, a lot of needs. But I didn't see that external. Um, external database, at least. Uh, I would. Um, I think it's an important point. We're moving that direction. I think Energy Star helps in, as a benchmark. We're seeing third-party utility pay services provide some of that. But you got to remember, this is data, and there's, there's there's concerns around that data. And so some people are concerned about giving up that data. And you think a data center might use 40% of its operating costs in energy, and one person's doing it at 30%, and the other one's at you know 35, and then they you know. There's a, and they're just a big data center company. You got, you know, people are sensitive to sharing that information. Um, but, you know, the other thing from my perspective as a bank, from an operational, putting my operational footprint hat on, um, it's uh, sometimes there's not, a, we're, there's not, like say for example, our headquarters building. It's got 1,200 traders in one floor. Um, it's, a, it's not classified as a data center because we're, we're in a virtualization environment, but it's a very special. There's probably only about 15 to 20 buildings that are even somewhat close to that. If I went into a benchmark tool, nothing would come up in the numbers that comes even close to that. Because um, when you're trading, a millisecond before <laughs> Goldman Sachs is there, is you want to beat the trade. So it's a different mindset. And then, by the way, because of compliance reasons, you have to store the data in separate data centers and all this stuff. So there's a whole bunch of other things. So it's hard to, the devil's in the details sometimes. But I think it's important that we move that way and collaborate. Hopefully, uh, as companies, we're not competing over carbon reductions. We're competing over products or getting people. So I think we can hopefully get beyond that. And I know within the banking industry, I talk to my peers quite a bit. And you know, we try to do a little informal benchmarking. But it would be great if it was easier yeah. uh, so we can improve it. Yeah. I think there's probably some areas where where it's easier to get started, because the devil is in the details. I think that's exactly where I was going to go, too. Uh, probably things like office buildings that are sort of more generic office buildings or schools or a building like this, maybe, where it's a, a little bit simpler and there's more peers. It, it, there's a chance to get a, a decent database of here's a good candidate list of things to do. Lighting controls is pretty often a, a pretty easy one to start with. Uh, and, and other things. Uh, factories are all unique, <laughs> and uh, maybe there's some things that you can try to do, and maybe it's harder. And transportation systems, fleets tend to be pretty unique, uh, and uh, so it, I think there's room, and I think we have to figure that out, and, and uh, let's, let's work on it. Let me just throw the question back to the group, particularly since we have so many different companies and, and industries represented here. How many companies here, if there was such a database, would put information into it for use by <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> no, more hands up than, than I was actually expecting. I, I know Toyota has their global Kaizen database. Every single engineering project, including all the energy efficiency projects, get documented in a uniform way. And if you're going to implement a lighting project or a motor upgrade or whatever, uh, in a Toyota facility, you're required not only to use that database, but to document whether or not your particular application differed from the, exam the, from, from the, from the elements that are in that database. Um, you know, we, lots of people would like to at least emulate Toyota in some of the things they've accomplished. But, but I think, you know, there are some concerns about, you know, not only the security of the information, or the confidenti possible confidentiality of the information, but then the flip side is, you know, uh, if if we could do something like this, uh, you know, how could we do it in such a way which maybe it remains confidential, but it also has some validity to people who are coming in to use it? I think it's a great, as a on a finda data geek, uh, you know, I think that idea is fabulous. Are there places you can start though where the data is not so sensitive in the public sector, schools? Uh, is, is that a place to start, maybe? And 
And also, you got to look at the SEC guidance on materiality for certain industries. You know, maybe, you know, and I know Coke is, and Pepsi are talking about water and issues, and maybe for certain issues, there, and I know there's new guidance coming out all the time on this stuff, but, you know, materiality um, is maybe something people should be looking at a little bit different, especially when you factor in new compliance and cost of regulations as well in certain, in certain countries. In terms of benchmarking, All right, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, I mean, gr granted, my, my experience was limited there three months and working within an existing framework, but a, a lot of the prioritization for capturing the actual metrics of individual projects was a, uh, a product of a couple different things. So again, in, in a diversified sort of situation, we split things up in terms of sort of the typical projects is what we, the common must-do projects. We have lighting, HVAC, compressed air was big in an industrial facility. And then we also split it up in terms of process. So especially that process was, was important to share. So that was kind of the key learnings because those are some of the breakthrough, really specific knowledge kind of projects, uh, really intimate knowledge of the system. Um, those kind of projects were, were integral to, to share across facilities. And then uh, also broke it up by, um, by region and kind of functionality overall. So I worked on the uh, collecting data and benchmarking for um, the uh, EMEA region, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, North America, and South America. And in all of those regions, it's, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different to sell projects depending on where you are. So in, uh, you know, in Europe, when electricity is 25 cents a kilowatt, uh, but the, electric, but the you know, more or less the energy is, is cleaner uh, in comparison, really easy to sell a project if it's, you know, if it's gonna lower just a little bit of electricity, that project gets sold like that, because it's usually less than a year payback. It's really easy to do, and I think that has a lot to do with the maturity of, um, maturity of energy efficiency in Europe. Then when we get to selling a project in North Carolina, I worked on, worked on an HVAC project, electricity is five cents a kilowatt. It actually, it actually was less, they were paying 49 cents a kilowatt. So it was really hard to sell a project with you know, five year payback on on HVAC, so it was kind of sharing the knowledge in the North, in North America region, especially in those uh, low cost regions, sharing how much of an environmental impact this could make towards the goal, yet in other areas it was, it was more of a financial decision. So it kind of varied between those, which, which kind of lumps, which buckets we threw projects into. You know, I would just add to that quick, is um, benchmarks are tools, and don't, don't over invest in them you know, whether it's Energy Star or Ash Array Standard or whether, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. You can get caught up in paralysis and analysis. And sometimes when I was even hearing some of the discussion before, and I'm not a finance guy, so I'm more like, think, you know, it, it scares me sometimes. No, it's a, but it's a, it's a, it's a known issue that I got to go, you know, you got to go in there and, and, and deal with it. But seriously, I've seen um, so much stuff just get, it was an excuse not to do something by changing the numbers and doing certain things. One thing I would just say quick too is that there's, this is relatively immature. You, know, you think about accounting, I came from big four, um, so I always use the accounting analogy where accounting standards for financial evolved over 100, 150 years really in modern times. We're now in this non-financial and starting to recognize there's a value to this stuff just like capital, financial capital. And so I think some of the things we were trying to harmonize some of the, you know, we, we, it's kind of like the GRI or carbon disclosure project, all these different groups out there trying to harmonize some of this. There's confusion just in the real estate world, what the interior square foot of a building is. There's rentable square feet and there's NIA, and then there's the BMO kind of standards, there's a core net. No one, there's different ways to, believe it, I was surprised because I'm not a real estate person. Well, yeah, I asked us, what's the size of the building? Well, it depends. 
you know, I remember when I used to do some of these kind of sweatshop monitoring, and we used to go in for the audit books to look at the payroll stuff, and you ask them the books, you know, which are the accounting records. So I said, which accounting records do you want? And I was like, oh boy, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same, like, it, but seriously, it, you know, um, there's a lot of work. We're still in the area, but you know what? That shouldn't stop the progression, even if you know it's good. So. We're moving in our world to look at occupant, you know, at occupancy as opposed to FTE. A lot of companies use FTE, but let's be real. We're, we're going to a more outsourced contractor environment, even in the US, and so that's gonna distort the numbers. We're actually densifying our space to get it so we can relieve vacant space and make it more efficient, getting more people into a space, but comfortable, so you're going to have a higher watts per square foot. Um, so, so they just have to be careful how you look into the numbers and look at a lot of them. Right? And there's they're such a wide, you know, say benchmarking. I mean, the, the first thing you need to ask is, what's the question? You know, what's an appropriate measure? You have to know what kind of question you're, you're, you're asking. I mean, you know, there's project level tracking and, you know, it was just described. There's site level, you know, sort of facility level benchmarks that you want to just track over time. How, how, how are you, you know, how, how are you progressing? And then there's portfolios, you know, measuring across facilities to the extent that that's possible. Um, benchmarking business practices too. I mean, it's the energy efficiency is, is not just about widgets. Um, it, you know, one of the comments, conversations I had earlier at one of the tables was, uh, you know, a lot of energy efficiency uh, and, and getting it done is about the business practices and people. You know, there's lots of smart engineers who know about lights and motors and, and things, but, you know, getting the energy efficiency done is also about uh, figuring out what are good business practices to implement these things. So there's lots of different kinds of, uh, you know, practices and, and and measures and, and you know, widgets and project level benchmarks. Um, my question was more on the implementation side for Eaton specifically because you already operate in the sustainability space. I was wondering if there were unexpected surprises in terms of trying to implement in-house something that you advise people on as your business. Lots. Uh, I mean, and, and we run into the same nightmares that everybody else does. And, and who could believe we we're doing something so crazy and efficient? <laughs> and, uh, so we have all those stories. And I'm, I'm not going to bore you with them because you can probably give them too. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of it then is just um, uh, we're a big, diversified company with lots of product lines. And we don't even know what they all are. And, it's not really a sustainability story, but we just this this week or this month, you didn't know this yet, but launched a a uh, internal program to let us buy our own products, <laughs> and so and uh, it it really drives our CEO nuts when he walks into one of our plants and sees competitors' products running the plant. It's just it's one of those things, and <laughs> and uh, so and we see you know. Kind of hydraulic products and electrical products and all kinds of stuff and and so so that knowledge gap is just huge and that's a constant education. I think the question has a lot to do with a repeatable process too and sort of this continuous improvement idea. Um, a lot, you know, a lot of the things that I actually ran into um, with with you know scoping out some of these projects and and early on you know made lighting. There's a great lighting project that that we just did a few years ago. I'm like, oh, okay, when'd you do it? Oh, 2002. It's great. So they had all, all new upgraded equipment, but then when you know, we went in there and did it again, it's like, oh, well, actually there's a bunch more savings because you know, we're a little more sophisticated in some of the equipment, we're a little more knowledgeable in some of the suppliers that can put together systems, um, even, in, even in Eaton equipment, having some of that available. So um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a one-time shot, and I think that says a lot about the importance of setting up a process and reevaluating once you, once you finish a project and saying, hey, well, you know, we did this lighting project five years ago, but maybe, there is a, maybe there's a need to systematically come in and just evaluate all our projects again on the same sort of, uh, uh, under the same sort of assumptions and, and kind of upgrade them for new technology and, and uh, new information that comes across. In the language of the previous panel, the low-hanging fruit keeps on growing. 
So I, I think we want oops, All right. one last question, and then we're going to move to the tables. And the charge for what we're going to talk about at the tables is going to shift just a little bit. So I'll give you that. Yeah, I guess just to that last point about the fruit that keeps growing back. And then I guess besides, you know, coming to an agreement on what should we be measuring, how should we be benchmarking, I think, you know, our program has kind of demonstrated that, you know, maybe we can figure out who should be doing that, that measuring. I think, you know, talking to all the other fellows, you know, some of us reported to a sustainability department, some of us reported through a facilities team, some of us through a marketing manager. And, you know, I don't know if there's any consensus on what is the job description that a company that's gonna be a leader in this space needs to have, you know, what kind of a organizational structure works best to keep, you know, keep that process of picking the fruit off that actually works, you know, I think, you know, my experience this summer showed that you can make a huge improvement in 10 weeks, and it wouldn't have mattered if I identified a lot more projects because there's only so much capital to put this year, and next year you're really gonna have to redo all that work because the technology's gonna change, the cost of work is gonna change. So I think, you know, somewhere maybe, a, you know, we talked about putting together a library of projects, you know, maybe some kind of research on, you know, what is the right structure or role within a company yeah, and I'd, I'd comment on that. I think, you know, it, and just like everything else, it always depends, right? So the answer is, nah, I don't know, it depends. Uh, in, in Eaton, my, my supervisor was, uh, again, he was in the indirect materials group, um, and he was the energy manager, again, similar to, um, to John from AT&T. And just as a side note, uh, I heard Pareto analysis and moved the needle about 4,000 times this summer. So I think they're all reading the same book. Everybody that's a manager that might be in here. Um, but, uh, but it was really useful in just in the way that Eaton's systems were set up where it was more centralized as opposed to decentralized. And all the purchasing for um, energy contracts was run through a third party contractor through Summit Energy. And so they actually were able to uh, kind of centralize a lot of the processes, especially establishing the carbon footprint was really easy because that third party was bringing all that data together. So in, in that circumstance, you know, in, for Eaton specifically, at least for the most part, the energy strategy coming out of that department made a lot of sense. Um, but then, of course, you know, we were having a discussion earlier at uh, table four over there about. Um, about this, the kind of the structure that's needed to happen if you have a lot of data centers. And if you have a data center manager that's, uh, you know, what were you saying? If there's a data, man data center manager is in charge for that whole budget, they are really incentivized to lower the cost well, if yeah, they can, and right? He pays the energy bill. Yeah, he pays the energy bill, so he's, yeah. Yeah, so he's extremely incentivized. So it, like everything, it depends, but, uh, but there's definitely that, that structure needs to at least be thought about, right? At least needs to come down from a high level and say, hey, this is what we're going to do, <laughs> whether or not it's, it's right initially, but say, hey, we're going to at least come up with a strategy to manage our energy. And uh, from there, if we need to tweak it, we can. But yeah. so, two, the, the needs, uh, it's a common, the, probably the number one barrier for a lot of organizations, including ours, is there needs to be um, a single point of collection where this information flows through. And that person needs to be empowered and has the uh, ability to escalate as challenges come up. Um, so, and it could be multiple people depending on, so you could, there needs to be a governance and a structure around this, um, and not ad hoc. It's kind of like the energy farmer, to use your analogy, that's growing the, the food to pick, and then, you know, <laughs> I'm stretching, it's late on Friday, so. <laughs> but, um, and, but then also harvesting, because the crop, it's a reoccurring portfolio. We're changing, we're growing the business, we're declining it, uh, there's new construction projects. And they, need to be, uh, and they need to be focused on that. And they also need the ability to be able to communicate well to a lot of different functions, as you can hear. And I think that's one of the key takeaways, I would say, is keep, as a lot of the enthusiasts in the room here, and we get kind of technical, which is great, and it's fun uh, at times, painful at others, uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple for the management, because um, often they get glazed over when you start getting a little too, too much. Well, I think we're going to break, but, but I, I have to say that from what I have seen, the really successful companies in terms of managing energy, someone in the corporation owns energy. Ultimately, there's somebody who, they may not be full, a full-time energy person, but there is someone 
that is going to be reporting responsible and they may have their energy champions amongst different plant managers and, and there's all kinds of structures that can work. But there's not someone who owns, sort of owns energy within a corporation, then you know, when the CEO makes a speech, you know, who does he call into his office and say, okay, how are we doing? So, um, we're gonna, yeah. We're gonna go to the tables, but a different charge. Yes, okay. well thanks to the panel and to Gail. Appreciate it. Um, I wanted to shift just the last uh, session here a bit. Um, my a few things that I've noticed in the discussion. One is that execution is really hard to break out, right? We were talking really across the whole spectrum from motivation and ownership to the financial pieces to getting it done in the field. And so in, in that sense, it's, it isn't maybe optimal to sort of address it sort of separately from the rest of the mix of what the what the uh, sort of uh, most successful strategy is for moving this stuff forward. Um, and the second thing is that, uh, you know, we are interested in taking this conversation forward and the key to really finding a basis for doing that is to identify what are some of the key questions that aren't answered. We spent the day sharing insights, which is great, and learnings with each other, and I think we've made good progress on that. But I don't think we've cracked the nut. I'm not sure. Maybe you know you can challenge me if you think we have. But I, I'm guessing that there are still some pretty big fundamental issues that are unresolved or that we don't have the, the kind of full understanding of that could help us really get traction against, against capturing the energy efficiency opportunity. So I wanted to shift this final session a little bit to kind of open up the frame to the whole day. Um, so from, from start, from motivation and organization all the way down through nitty gritty, um, sort of getting it done, I'd like the, the tables to focus on identifying maximum two ideas or two questions that you think are the kind of key questions that one, we don't fully understand, and two, if we did understand, we would be able to make a lot better progress on, on these issues. And I do this um, partly because I think, um, you know, the problem solution uh, phase is actually easier than the problem finding phase. Um, having a very well constructed question that goes at, to the root of some of the issues that we're, we're addressing I think can be really useful in helping us mobilize around that. It could be the basis for an ongoing discussion or research effort or ongoing collaboration for us. So, so I guess sort of in the spirit of looking forward from this, uh, from today, if, if you could spend the last um, phase today around your tables talking about what are still the unanswered questions and how would we formulate that question in a way that we think we could really make progress and to the extent that you could imagine how would we address a question like that maybe it's on the basis of some data that we'd want to see to be able to do it maybe it would be through some kind of uh, you know, uh, deeper investigation around this to the extent that you could sort of say, here's the question, and here might be a way of trying to go about that question, and no more than two, because I think part of what we want to do is, I think of these, th these uh, conferences being sort of diamond-shaped, right? You sort of start out at a point, and you open up the diamond real wide, and you think about all the issues and the connectivity and uh, sort of blow your mind, but in the end, you have to kind of go around the corner, and you have to come back down and focus it in on something that you think you can really make progress on. So we have a shortened sort of day here. We're going like this, and I think now I want to sort of take it and begin to hone in two questions that you think are really um, key for moving us forward on this agenda and whatever ideas you have about how we might make that happen. Is that, is that clear as a kind of guidance for this final conversation? Yes? Oh, I just want to say one quick thing. I, um, just based on, you kind of sparked uh, a thought in my mind of, on this information sharing bit. And, and I had the great opportunity to sit up here, which is kind of a perk of working for the sponsor of the <laughs> conference. But um, you know, a lot of the things that I talked about here were just kind of based off all the fundamental things that uh, all the Climate Corps fellows talked about on, uh, on our Google groups and, and all of those resources provided by EDF. So, um, this idea of sharing all this information has been extremely useful and educating and so it's these times like this when we get to answer, kind of open up and even if we're not answering questions, get to ask questions are some of the best, uh, best learning times. So I, I just wanted to thank everybody that, was, uh, that contributed to that because that's kind of where I pulled a lot of my, uh, my comments from. So one more hand to the, all the Climate Corps fellows and their sponsors. <laughs> So 
So we have about 20 minutes for the, uh, for the conversation on key questions. Only two, but make them good. <laughs> we'll gather them up at the end, and then I'd like to come back at the end, and we'll do the final kind of uh, wrap-up and evaluations, and then we'll head to the reception. So have at it. Thanks. All right. Well, everybody looks like they are deeply engaged in conversation, which is great. But I'd like to ask all of you to, um, to wrap up. And um, we actually do have a hard stop in about five minutes to be out of the room. So, um, so we can't afford to let our ideas flow over the time band. So can I, can I have everybody's attention? Excuse me? Can I have everybody's attention? Um, I'm going to have to be a little bit of a time Nazi here to, uh, to get us out of the room in the next five, <laughs> five minutes. Um, we wanted to uh, wrap up the formal uh, session today. Um, all of you have now identified the questions, and we won't have a chance to hear from all of you what you think those key questions are. Hopefully, you can take those into the conversation in the reception, um, and we'll be walking you over there in a moment. Um, and one of the things we want to do is, is post these over there. So you'll be actually able to see the other table's two questions um, put up on the, uh, on the walls there. So it won't just be the two from your table. You'll be able to see everybody else's. And are we going to do the, the evaluation too? We'll have a mechanism for you to identify what you think are the really salient questions coming out of the conversation today. And so we get some sense of rating of those. So stay tuned for that. We'll be able to close the loop on that. Um, let me just ask for one table to share what you think the two questions are. Do I have a volunteer from one table? Okay, yes, great. Uh, so, big, one big question, how do we increase adoption of energy efficiency initiatives at mid-sized companies? Okay, uh-huh. And then, I, I guess it's not quite a question, but we saw the big issue of split incentives. So, the fact that there's tenant lease, sublease, or even inside a company, tax accounting versus facilities. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and those are two themes I think we've heard throughout the day, and I like that sort of different granularities of, uh, of companies as well. Um, I'd like to wrap today. I'd like to thank all of you because you all have been really um, co-participants in a great process. So I'd like to, first of all, just give a hand to everybody here who's here in the room. I think our hypothesis of filling the room with a bunch of smart, motivated people who have had an intense experience over the summer around these issues to share their experiences has been really validated, so I'm thrilled about that. I'd also like to thank uh, a few different people. One is uh, EDF and their partnership in this, especially Rachel's role in that. So thanks, EDF. And then the whole set of people here at Duke that have been involved in this discussion, many of which who are not here, but uh, you've met them over the cor uh, course of the day, um, from the uh, Fuqua School of Business, from Nicholas School of the Environment, Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy, from the Econ Department. So we've really reached out across campus, and um, I'm really excited that we've been able to have this kind of experience of reaching across boundaries. Uh, Gar Gary Jareffi and CGGC as well. So thanks to all of my Duke uh, uh, supporters and participants in this. And finally, to the sponsors, to, uh, to Ingersoll Rand and to the Eaton Corporation that made it possible to bring everybody here together to cover the, uh, the, the, the flight and the overnights for those of you who uh, were Climate Corps fellows coming in. Um, really appreciate the, the um, sponsors who made that possible. So they're not all here, but I'd like to thank them as well. And with that, I'd like to um, wrap. I'd like to thank you all for being here. When we go over, we'll walk over to the reception together. Uh, I, I'd like to, um, we'll do the rating exercise on the questions. We'll also do the card drop. So if you want to stay involved in this conversation, let us know. Pass your cards to, uh, to us. And uh, Gary Jareffi from CGGC will um, share some of his uh, reflections on, on the day and some of his insights about where we take this forward. So. Uh, 
I think that's it. I'd like to ask you to fill out your questionnaires. I left some at each of the tables. It'd be really useful just to get your feedback. It's a first time through experiment for us. So any feedback you have about how we do these kind of events and how we make them better would be really appreciated. So with that, thanks very much. And let's uh, head over to the reception when you get finished with your surveys. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.